Well, good morning, everyone. As everyone gets in here, I'm just going to do a couple housekeeping. Um, my name is Christina Carell. I, uh, again, am the statewide soil health and cover crop educator, uh, house out of Lake County. Um, and in our session, this is you're in the soil health session, and we have who our researcher who's in charge of this area is Dr. Sig Snap, and she's a professor of soils and cropping systems ecology and associate director of the Center for Global Change and Earth observations. We do have a rather large um, breakout room. So if you would like to put your questions in the chat box, if you're uncomfortable bringing it up, that will help um, us organize our time. And uh, I would be happy to moderate the chat session. Um, when Sig's done, she's going to give us a short presentation on some ideas that she has um, that cover crops can use to increase soil health. With that, Sig, if you want to take over. Good morning, all. This is great to be here with you. And uh, yeah, really interesting seeing what's going on around the state in this virtual time, uh, a wonderful chance to get out and about, so to speak. So just thought I would recap a few resources and thoughts about soil uh, health and cover crops and look forward to your questions. That's really what this is all about. So here are a few slides. So, uh, this was just coming here. I wanted to start with a few resources. You can at any time uh, Google just Soil Health, Michigan State University. Christina and I should come up. Some of these resources such as Advanced Soil Health through Soil Organic Matter Management, an extension bulletin that's for free, a PDF. There's recent uh, presentations such as for beginning farmers on measuring soil health, which I think may be of interest these days. We get told so many different ways to measure soil health. So I encourage checking those out. So we saw that many different things that farmers and everyone in this audience are looking for from cover crops. And I wanted to emphasize roots because many of the services, the many of the benefits, nature's services, so to speak, that we get from cover crops, all have to do with roots. But because roots are below ground, we can't see them unless we take a shovel out. We often don't realize that not only are we getting erosion control, but we're also getting building of organic matter. So you can see that when you see, anytime you look at it, how a grass, how it has these little crumbs of soil attached to the roots, that has to do with the mycorrhizae and the binding agents around those roots. So here's another, can you go, can you click again? Yeah, so you can see how it kind of binds together the sand so that one of the secrets to improving a sandy soil is to build our organic matter. And cover crops or vegetation all year round through uh, pastures, or if you can't do pasture cover crops, or even just growing wheat. All those winter cover, living roots all the year round makes, uh, builds up those aggregates that then protect any organic matter we have. So the secret to building soil health in a sandy soil is organic matter through roots. And the interesting thing, the building of soil organic matter, which can happen even faster in clay soil, where sometimes you have flooding and um, ponding issues, is also soil organic matter. So whether your soil is too sandy or too clay, you can't change that texture, but you can change the soil health. And it's particularly through these roots. And you can see the living clods and how microbes and uh, earthworms shown here are, once you build that home for them through these roots and their associated aggregates, that builds organic matter. So let's, what does that really mean in terms of where does organic matter come from? Can you go to the next slide? So we often look at the above ground and we see our cover crops are giving us lush green, which often translates into nutrients, nitrogen, in the coming year as we till it in or uh, kill it down. But it's really on what you see on the right where we have these tillage radishes that are building the organic matter that um, gives us many of the benefits. So above ground is an indicator, but what's actually going into organic matter is the below ground. And this has recently been shown. Can you show the next slide? Through research that has followed the atoms, and we can see that 
You know, when people grow a lot of corn, sometimes they think, oh, that's providing organic matter because you see all that stover on top of the soil, right? And sometimes you think soybeans or common bean, dry beans, that they aren't providing much organic matter because those residues disappear so quickly, right? They just, at the end of the year, they're gone. But it turns out only about a third of the above ground leaves really turn ultimately into organic matter. Some of it provides nitrogen, which is great for your next crop, but it doesn't build your long-term organic matter. What it matters is your roots, particularly cover crop roots. Something like a vetch, also clovers, 70 to 85% will translate into organic matter. Alfalfa roots are really good too. Corn roots, not as much. You might have a lot of corn roots, but they aren't turning into organic matter long-term benefits. So it's important to remember that it's a quality, not just a quantity. And that cover crop roots in particular are building up those aggregates that in turn protect any soil organic matter you have and help you build longer term. So this is kind of new research showing us that um, it's roots that really matter. So when you want to build organic matter, go out and take a shovel and look at these roots. So let me just summarize some aspects of uh, organic matter and improving soil health. It's both about your inputs, growing more carbon or organic inputs through growing a cover crop, right? And, but also reducing your losses. So it's not just a matter of increasing the amount of straw, for example, um, you can see from the wheat straw in this picture, it's also that green living diversity of cover crops. So you wanna diversify your regular cash crops if possible, if your markets allow that. So grow just a, more than just corn and soybean, try and grow some small grains, try and grow sugar beets, any kind of diversity helps there. And then you can further diversify and provide that all important winter cover through keeping things green. This means you're supporting microbes all year round through those roots and building aggregates. If you can, combine it with something like compost, even small amounts, because the combined benefit of cover crops and compost is really how we build organic matter. But we also want to reduce losses. As we heard from one of the farmers, if you can possibly make your tillage more judicious, more careful, um, use less of it, try and just do tillage. If you do any tillage only when the uh, weather conditions uh, keep from compacting your soil. And finally, the diversity matters again because some tissues, some plant types, they decompose slowly. So that would be something like wheat. And then other ones faster, like clovers. And the combination is what keeps microbes the diversity of microbes that we want to see in soil biology. It's like providing a diverse diet. We know that if we eat too much of something, even something delicious like sweet corn, that it isn't good for our health and for our gut. So the microbes in our gut. So it's the same for the microbes in the soil. They need a diverse diet. So how much diversity do we need? Something we could talk about today. One more click here. Um, I am Using the literature, I think three is enough. So at least if we have three different cover crops. Um, so I was encouraging people, Christina, to start to put questions in the chat or just to shout them out because okay. um, it started here as other people join us. All right. If you have a chat, go, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat box. And, and you know, if you want, if you're comfortable, you may go ahead and open up your microphone um, and ask the question. That's okay, too. Has everyone, anyone tried out mixtures of cover crops? What type did you try? Or have you seen soil health benefits of cover crops? Really curious what people are trying out around the state. I have crickets chirping behind me and it's just, it's not <laughs> on here. So I can tell you, I mean, if you remember back to when the one in Lake County, Jack Thornton was talking, um, he has seen an increase um, 
and you heard him talk about the increase in organic matter that he was able to get by in integrating cover crops and it's sand as you were seeing we have pretty sandy soil here and we did see um, definitely an increase in one of his fields of that organic matter just by adding cover crops into that rotation. Now cover crops alone isn't it. I mean he has cattle on there and he's got the forage so he's got longer term like Sig was talking about a lot more um, different diversity of roots in the system. Um, but we have seen some increase in organic matter in a corn soybean rotation just by adding the cover crops. And if you can add in winter wheat, we've even seen a, into the rotation. In those off years, we've seen another increase in that organic matter just by that third crop with the cover crop in the years that they need it. So, so I mean, it's doable. It's, very, it's something that can be done. So we have a question in the chat from Quebec. A popular here is crimson clover annual ryegrass and radish. So you don't have to, um, you can observe less a reduction in nitrogen application on corn in the year after. That's a great point that if you can include legumes, they can be a little more expensive seed, but definitely you can cut back on your fertilizer. There's a nitrogen credit. That's a really great mix, I just want to say, because you've got a legume, you've got a rye grass, which is really good for root aggregates, and you've got a radish, which has a little diversity of its own uh, because it, it doesn't, uh, it tends to suppress uh, root rot diseases uh, and some nematodes. So you've got a mix of three different types of families. And so that's what we like to see. If you put oats, and rye, they're the same family, they're both grasses. But if you can put a legume, a mustard, a brassica, and a, um, also a grass, the three together are just, that's top notch. So nice on that. Okay, we we're also hearing about a pea, rye, clover, kale, and radish in a blend and had good results. Again, you have a very nice mix there. You've got two legumes, peas and clover. You've got rye. Rye is one of my favorites because although you have to have a plan for it in the spring because it gets what they call rank, it gets really vigorous growing. So you gotta have a plan to manage it before you grow your next crop. But it just gives you so much root. Um, it's really spectacular at building organic matter. Um, one of the best things for the winter. If you can devote a whole uh, field to in a summer situation, then sorghum city and grass is the best way to build organic matter, perhaps with peas or vetch or sweet uh, clover in with the sorghum city and grass. But if you have a winter situation, then if you can afford some field peas and rye and clover and then a oilseed radish, that's a champion mix. A little more expensive though than your crimson clover and in your rye grass we heard about from, from Canada. So a more expensive mix would be field peas because it's a big seed, um, clover and kale, but a cheaper one might be the annual ryegrass and radish. But they both would provide you that mix of residues that we're really seeing uh, builds organic matter, but also provides the nutrients. Some things build organic matter like rye, but you sometimes tie up your nutrients in the short term which can be a problem um, unless you use compost if you're an organic grower or fertilizer to make up for that. So legumes provide nutrients, but if you have a lot of rye or oats or annual ryegrass in there, sometimes they, they're they improving your water quality and they're improving your soil quality, but they reduce your fertility, your fertility in the short term. So keep that in mind. You wanna combine that with compost in your first year if you have a lot of grass there. One of so, the, yeah, go ahead. Christine. One of the um, demonstrations, and this is just a, anecdotal. So we're we're looking at doing a, a more in depth research that we did in Christmas trees. I cover all commodities, so I do a lot of those other <laughs> crops. Um, but in Christmas trees, um, I don't know if you know anything about Christmas trees, but they beat the soil to death. I mean, a lot of compaction issues. Um, there's a lot of things. So once they lift the trees out, a lot of times that they have a year off before they come back in and plant. So what we have been seeing is that a monoculture, just one crop of sorghum Sudan. Um, has done tremendous soil building. It breaks that compaction, tremendous amount of biomass we get out of that, uh, and then we're getting quite a bit of organic matter um, buildup just on a monoculture. We actually see more 
on just putting sorghum in Sudan compared to the mixes that we've used. So that's another option. Um, if you, and again, they take they can take that crop out of rotation for a year, that field out of rotation, and then we can do that. So we're working on that a little bit more in some of the Christmas trees, but they, they use a lot of cover crops for building up that soil organic matter just because it's a long-term crop. Yeah, I, the sorghum sedan grass is my go-to if you have a summer window, if you're going to devote a whole year. But the other one might be alfalfa, particularly if you're an organic grower, um, you want to, sorghum sedan grass again would tie up your nitrogen for a while, good for suppressing thistle, but um, and for conventional production, I think it, it can be a really good go-to if you've got that year because it um, there's there's nothing like it. The massive root system it has is incredible, but it's a summer heat-loving crop. So if in the winter you only have the winter time, then rye's good. Okay, 60-inch corn with um, cover crops. So by done any studies, do you, you mean you're looking at interseeding? I think we saw some examples of interseeding today, and we saw a comment from Holmaden. They used, you know, you can interseed. Um, if you've got a high boy or you're flying it on. But as we heard from Karen Renner, our weed um, field crop and cropping system specialist, as Karen said, if you have a very uh, dense corn canopy, such as field corn, then it's a challenge to overseed um, using helicopter or flying on in some way, right? Um, you have to figure out how to get enough seed there under that canopy and then with the uh, light suppression it can be a real challenge. Sometimes annual ryegrass is one of the only things that will survive. Red clover can survive under a wheat canopy, but there's only a few cover crops that like um, that low light environment. Uh, we saw there was a link that was sent earlier about cover crops. Um, so yeah, so it's challenging with field crops. Um, obviously silage and uh, seed corn uh, sweet corn, these things give us a bit more options because they have a bit more light coming through. I think the question was related to 60 inch corn row spacing. Ah, oh, sorry. I thought you meant how tall the corn was. Yeah. So, yeah. So that gives us a lot more options, um, I would think. Although I don't, we haven't done that because we normally um, use closer spacing corn. But, um, but certainly it should provide you some, as long as you have the light there, biophysically, that should work. Have you tried that? Uh, Jack Thornton tried it a bit. I haven't been out to check his field to know how well it's done, but it's something that I am uh, interested in and would like to do more with some clients to see if it's something that can be done here. And some yeah, of those, yeah, some of those pictures you saw on Jack's was some of his 60 inch. It, it looks really nice. You can do it. Yeah. So there isn't too much of a yield cut height hit from, you know, the wider spacing. Um, not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 you know, it's a give and take, you know, what the yield, it, it, you need to look at economics, just not yields. True. true so, true. you know, that's one of the challenges we see in row crops. We always talk about yield, but let's be honest, it's the bottom yeah. line. How much money am I making? So if I can save money in the long run, it's better right. off. So. And, and I've also heard some things with the change in weather with the more wider spacing of rainfall events some years, you know, the, a lot of the models are predicting we get rain less frequently now that some of these wider spacing may be useful in this uh, variable climate that we have now. So that might be another reason to try it. And then obviously any way you can fit cover crops in could help with, um, again, this variable rainfall because as we build organic matter, it holds more moisture and you can get you a few more days of holding moisture so that you can get through if you have 10 days between rainfall rather than used to be able to count on more frequent rainfall. It also can help with infiltration so that you hold more moisture. There used to be a lot of worries about cover crops like using up moisture in the spring, and it can sometimes, like rye, but generally if longer term, it'll build up your organic matter, which will hold more moisture, and it'll allow more water to come in and get infiltrated like a sponge. Uh, you can imagine water going over a hard floor, it just will run quickly, but over a rug, it infiltrates in through those pores around the cover crops. And so then you hold more moisture and then we can deal with these dry spells we're getting. So again, your 60 inch would let you to have more infiltration, allow you to put cover crops in there. So that, yeah, I look forward to hearing more how that works out. 
Greg, can you give us some of your um, expertise? You, you, I know that you've been doing some, some interceding um, the last couple of years, and you just broadcasted, right? Uh, most of what uh, I've done personally uh, as demonstration plots is just broadcast on small scale uh, using a diverse mix of, uh, well, it depends on when I'm doing it, but uh, a grain such as oats or rye, annual ryegrass, turnips, radish, crimson clover. Um, what the customers are, are doing, you know, a lot of our, that, that I have contracted in silage corn is annual ryegrass, uh, turnips and radish, and uh, crimson clover usually. In soybeans, um, as you mentioned before, that if you do it, uh, cover crop seeding early, you do have issues with harvest. You really have to slow that combine down so to get all that green matter through. Uh, and some have issues with uh, the tuber on the radish and turnips. So for the brassica, we go to uh, a rape or kale or something like that that's just leafy and not uh, has that, that big tuber to get caught up in the head. Have you tried? like oriental mustard because they've had good luck with that washington state in uh terms of kind of imp if they have root rot issues or we have not yet yeah thanks for sharing that again that nice three mix of uh, a brassica a, a grass and a legume there used to be a lot of worries about annual ryegrass but i know south of here it's been very very popular and we've had good luck with it in some of our sites in southwest Michigan. So uh, as long as you have a plan for keeping it under control, uh, I think annual ryegrass is becoming one of my new favorites. Another interesting thing that Jack is doing is uh, annual hay crops with sorghum Sudan, teff, um, millet, and I forget what else he has in there, but he mows that, gets a couple cuttings off of that, and then he drills uh, a diverse cover crop mix into that uh, just for continued soil health benefits and then I think he's even able to get a, a third cutting off of that before uh, we get a frost on that stuff. I'm going to share my screen just a minute. I want you to see a picture when I was talking earlier about um, timing your inner when you intercede. I'm going to throw this picture up and this is one of the um, that J Jack took a couple years ago when he first started interceding into soybeans. Everyone see that? <laughs> that is a problem. Wow. Um, actually, we had to contact Dr. Uh, um, Sprague to ask, how do we kill those cover crops? Those yeah. had to be killed. Yeah. So that, that's, that's one of those timing issues. And we had a bumper crop. It was a beautiful year. So that's the, that's the radish and turnips yeah. they've got in inner seeding and soybeans. Yeah, great, great livestock feed. But if you don't have some use like that, or if it's real compaction, obviously that makes a lot of bio pores and you know they'll die back and it's very smelly too <laughs> it's going to be quite yeah. a smell and and you know he does use livestock i mean he had livestock but you, yeah you know we you can't <laughs> come on your beans like that so right yeah well that's why i hope people try oriental mustard i think it's uh, pretty promising and very cheap because you can buy it as mustard seed rather than specialized cover crop so you can get get that and we have, we have um, been putting a lot of oriental mustard and other mustards into our demonstration plots we've been doing around the state. And we have pretty good luck, um, again, with make sure we have moisture. And then on our part of the state, I put some in over in Manistee. Um, the issue uh, up there was, was a moisture and temperature. Oriental mustard's a warm season. We put it in later. Um, that we normally would, but we did that because I didn't want to have to kill it. We wanted it to die. We didn't want it to reseed itself the next year. So you got to really think about that seed too in the following year. Yeah, we do have an extension bulletin on it. We couldn't make it work in the spring because it doesn't like that cold uh, soil, as you said, but in the fall window, it's good. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's some other, as we heard, um, rapeseed and so on that may fit this more cool season loving. So there's a number of options out there, winter and summer. Great. Any other soil health questions? I think an aggressive campaign of, as we heard from Greg about trying, um, uh, if you can fit a hay crop in, then followed by diverse cover crops, that's ideal. We, we need to try and figure out ways, you know, if you're just growing corn, soybean, it's harder. 
Um, it, it, we've found it can take eight years before you see soil organic matter gains if you're using corn soybean or corn corn soybean. But if you can get winter wheat in there and then get a red clover, um, or if you can put alfalfa in for a year. So there's a, a number of ways that you can try and get into a more diverse setup and that's really critical if the first step is just try cover crops and then the second is how can we keep diversifying those cover crops mm -hmm. and i want to reiterate there there's a number of us around the state that can help you do that so don't think you're alone on that so um we like doing it we enjoy it so please feel free, even though most of us are homebound right now, we do answer our phones and emails. Um, I'm working right now all morning with a, a nursery grower who's trying to integrate cover crops into his nursery stock, which is totally different. Um, yeah. But, you know, we're here to help you. And your NRCS is here. Greg is here. Tom, Tom Hanselman's here. So there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of experts out there that can help you do this. That's a great point. And I hear a number of uh, promotion of different types of inoculums and compost. Compost can be great, but cover crops to me are what then really um, keep the living biota, the microbes and stuff growing all winter. So, um, and all year round. So whatever type of investment you're making in soil health, make sure that cover crops are part of your tools is, is what I always emphasize that you need that as part of your tool set. So I just want to encourage people to take uh, soil health measurements, your soil organic matter. It's part of your routine testing, um, but you might try compaction measurements like using your uh, flag to try and see how compacted your soils are, trying different ways to see how much nitrogen, like a side dress measurement, um, PS and T. These types of things help us understand how our soils are functioning. So I just want to encourage soil testing as a way to monitor the benefits from the cover crop, as well as your observations of crop health, obviously. So uh, we're growing more and more trying different types of soil health measurements these days. So uh, check with your local either MSUE or other, um, your um, ANL, different types of soil tests, uh, testing out there more and more. It's starting to be a way to um, be able to monitor soil health. But soil organic matter is kind of the, the gold standard. So definitely recommend testing that at least every four years very carefully and learn how your soil is changing. Seeing the trends over time and comparing to a benchmark if you can, such as your uh, fence row is really important to see, is your program working to improve your soil health? So if you, if you need help on how to do that, Paul and I both, Paul Gross and I both do a lot of that through the state and we teach a lot of farmers how to, how to do basic in-field soil testing. Awesome. Very important. So with that, thank you very much for coming. Um, again, when you get your email with the thank you for showing up, you will have all of our contact information so that you'll know how to contact us. So thank you.